Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. So, yep, in the last five minutes, I kind of told you everything you needed to know, and we're good for this week. So I'll talk to you later. Uh, all right. So <laughs> let me back up just a couple of steps, seeing as nobody could hear me. It'll be really fast. Hey, start the lecture. Make sure people can hear you. Uh, last week we installed database, learned how to turn things on and off, uh, learned how to make databases. If you haven't started, you better get after it or you're going to have a painful last few minutes before the assignment is due. Uh, make sure you keep track of Blackboard. That's what I'll communicate to you. Uh, two is about installing your own database and then uh, the 830 six part of this the sort of extra work is going to be uh, installing apex and then lastly in the future if I'm standing here talking on camera and you can't hear me let me know sooner <laughs> this week um, all right last week we uh, cruised through getting a bunch of stuff installed including the database learned about starting and stopping and so this week, I want to make sure that you know how to make Flash work on your remote desktop and uh, be able to log into EM. And then we're going to dig into how to change your Bash profile uh, so that you don't have to really run that .orm command anymore because that gets annoying after a while. So there's a, a couple of configuration things you can do to make that go away. And then we're going to set up auto start so you don't have to worry about starting your database anymore. It'll turn on and off uh, with your instance if, uh, if we configure this thing correctly. And uh, both those things are a part of your uh, assignment too, right? So let me move some stuff out of my own way here and I will change my share. change it over to here. I'm going to move that out of the way. So all right, here I am on my desktop. And uh, if you can uh, not see my desktop, be sure to let me know. <laughs> but uh, here I am on my desktop. And, and one of the things I really want to talk about is, okay, what's going on when you're doing this, this dot or M thing, right? So if we, if I run this command right here, echo Oracle home, I get nothing. And, uh, and this is really what uh, the aura M command is doing for you. It's setting a whole bunch of environmental variables. So if I say dot and aura M now, and uh, you know, I give this thing, uh, it's, I give this thing my system identifier for the database I'm interested in, and then I rerun that Echo Oracle Home, I should actually see a value there. Now, the reason this is important, because a lot of the software that you use on your Oracle database is kind of dependent on these variables being set. So if you want to run SQL Plus, or you want to run uh, DBCA, if uh, these environment variables aren't set, um, it isn't going to work, right? So and this is session dependent. So if I close this window here, 
I open a new terminal up and I try to echo my Oracle home again, I should find that it's not set because I only set it for that uh, editor session. And if I tried to run SQL plus right now, uh, my machine's going to tell me I've never heard of SQL plus because it doesn't have the variable set that it needs in order to make that go. So what I want you guys to do is just kind of stop worrying about this. Uh, by setting up what's called your um, your bash RC file and this is basically a, a file that gets run every time some sort of session is created on your behalf and it will do kind of what you tell it to do so the way that you find uh, this file is you actually go to your home directory so I'm gonna change directory and I'm gonna hit this tilde sign which is really just a shortcut to go says go to the current users home directory and now if I switch over here and list I just see all the stuff that's in my home but if I list, list with the uh, dash a command uh, I'll see that it'll also show me all of these uh, hidden files, right? And the two that we're kind of interested in here are the bash profile and the, and the bash RC. So uh, if we open up our uh, bash profile, we'll see that it actually references this bash RC file. And so there's this little function in here, this little command that says, hey, uh, go out and look at this bash RC file. I mean, if there's a bunch of stuff in there, uh, go ahead and use it, uh, right? So um, without getting into the sort of details about uh, what the difference between these two files is, if you only want to edit one of them, the best thing to do is just to edit the bash RC file. So we could actually come in here and set all the variables that we need to run our Oracle software in this uh, bash pro profile file, but we are um, going to use the bash RC. So what I'm gonna do is just quit out of here and then we will open up the bash RC file. And we can see in here that it's uh, basically kind of got the same thing. There's a uh, global file definition for this too that we could be using, but we'll go ahead and just use this one here. And um, what you can see right now is this thing has just got that little function in it and nothing else. Now in, the, um, in our PowerPoint presentation, which uh, I can, probably post online for you guys here in just a minute. I've actually got a uh, set of commands uh, that you need to put into this file. And uh, for right now, I can actually put this into the uh, chat window, which will, uh, I think, make it easier for people to follow along. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, post all the stuff that we're gonna put into this file inside of the chat window. So give me just a second here to copy it. All right. Hold on just a sec, copy and Naturally, it's fighting me, so give me just a second here. I'll post this in the notepad, make it easier for everyone. All right, I'm gonna stop my share for just a second so I can get control of my desktop. And then I'm gonna grab my notepad file. And then we'll copy this from Notepad and paste it into the chat window. There we go. All right, so hopefully everybody can see that. I think I actually got it in there twice. So let me just uh, paste it in there one more time and give you one version of it. So these are all the things that we're gonna put into our bash file. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen one more time. And all 
All right. So now I'm here in my bash RC file and I've got all those commands that I pasted into the, uh, into the chat window. And so I'm just going to hit I to insert in here and go ahead and paste directly in. And now you can see, uh, what we've put in here is just all of these, um, uh, variables that need to be set, right? So when you see this command that says uh, export and uh, then a variable and us setting it, what that means is basically just set this variable uh, on the system and then, uh, then that value will be in there. So what should happen is if I've done this correctly, um, we will, I will, um, no longer ever have to run the dot or m command again so the important thing for you guys to look at here is this uh your server host name actually needs to be replaced by your server host name and so you can see right here in my window at the very top of it it's actually got the host name uh right there and so i can just type that in and my particular one is going to be ip-172-31 31 dash 19 dash 140 your IP is going to be something different from that I absolutely promise you so make sure you don't put mine in there or it isn't going to help you very much uh, the other things you're going to want to change is this value here for the unique name and for the SID so I'm going to set mine to the uh, my CDB one and now uh, that should be all I need to do to these variables. And all I need to do is hit escape and uh, write this file. In order to reload this bash RC file, all you have to do is type source. And uh, if you happen to be in your home directory, you could just type the file name. But uh, no matter where you are, you can hit the tilde to reference your home directory. And then it's just dot uh, bash uh, RC, oops, RC, and that will reload that. So if uh, if I'm not crazy uh, and I haven't jacked anything up, uh, now when I uh, actually enter one of these new windows, uh, these variables ought to be set for me. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I got this stuff in there right and echo the Oracle Home. And you can see now, hey, because of those modifications I made to the bash RC, I no longer have to be concerned with running the dot or M uh, command and I can type directly SQL plus and it should just start up for me. So uh, as, uh, as a means of review here, we'll just jump in pretty quick and show how we start our environment up and I want to show you guys a little bit of a, a secret here I haven't really shared with you when you're on your operating system uh, SQL plus will actually just um, acknowledge the fact that it's the Oracle user and you don't actually even need to use a password when you're logging into SQL plus because it knows that you're on the OS that uh, owns the database instance and therefore doesn't require a password to get in so that's another little bit of a time saver when you're getting into SQL Plus. And so we can see here that I am connected to an idle instance. And uh, I know I'm on my CDB1. If I wanted to start this thing up, I would just uh, type startup. And uh, then the database will actually go through the process of uh, starting itself up. And uh, at that point, I should be able to do something like select uh, instance name from v dollar sign instance, and it helps if you spell it correctly, and it will tell me which instance I'm co connected to. Now, as a part of this um, assignment, one of the things we're doing is creating multiple databases, right? So I know I started my CDB1 up, but what about my CDB2? So uh, just because I've set all those variables with the um, bash RC, I can actually run the dot or m anyways. And really the only purpose for me running this now is gonna be to switch my CDBs. And I'm gonna start my CDB2 this time. And so if I type SQL plus again, we'll log in, sys as sys DBA. 
and skip the password. And you say, hey, I'm connected to an idle instance again. If I can start this one up, um, then it will start it up. And if I run that same select command at this point, we'll see that uh, we are actually connected to the to the my cdb2 so select instance name from v dollar sign instance and now we'll see that the my cdb2 is up okay so even though we're going to learn how to auto start all this stuff it's still important to know how to start up and shut down your instances because you may want to do that independent of your machine uh, and then it's also uh, important to get in your head that the um, the database software and the database server is sort of independent of the database instances. So currently I have two separate databases running on this server. They're both container databases and they actually both have uh, pluggable databases as a part of them as well. Uh, so you can run many, many databases on one server and many, many pluggable databases on one container database. And uh, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more as the semester goes along here. So I'm going to exit here. And what we're going to see is I'm going to try and start up a SQL developer and connect to one of these instances. And this a lot of this stuff is a review, but I think it's important to um, play with this stuff a little bit and, and understand what you're doing so you really have a good concept of uh, what's actually going on on your database server. So if I uh, go ahead and, and double click on uh, my, sys, uh, my CDB1 with this, it's gonna say, hey, an error was encountered. Uh, I couldn't connect this thing. Network adapter couldn't establish a connection. Well, the reason for that is that the actual listener is not started. If I were to do LSNR CTL for listener control and check the status, I would see that uh, this thing is not running. If I said LSNR CTL start, the listener should start up. But one of the things we're going to see is, hey, it currently supports no services. So generally what you want to do is you want to start the listener before you start your databases up or uh, the databases won't have a chance to register with the listener when they start up. But if you happen to do that and you got things out of order, uh, you can actually just go into SQL Plus and uh, manually tell the database to register with the lister. And the way we do that is we just say alter system uh, register. And if we do that, it'll say that the system is altered. If we jump back out of SQL plus here, and then we do the listener status one more time, we will see that, hey, we've actually uh, registered our databases with the system. And now if I jump back to SQL Developer and I try to connect again, we'll see that it's happy because the network uh, listener is actually listening. So I've had a few questions uh, over the last week of, hey, uh, what does the listener do, right? What's it, uh, what, what, what is its purpose? You know, I don't quite understand what's going on with that as opposed to the database. So the listener is, uh, kind of does exactly what it sounds like it does. It's, uh, its purpose in life is to handle the network traffic between you and the database. So it listens on a port on the machine, and when it receives a request, it passes that information on to your database instance, and when it gets a response from the database, it routes that response back to you. So the database and the uh, listener are two independent applications that uh, obviously do two uh, different things. The listener's uh, job is to handle uh, communicating over TCP IP, and the database's job is to be a database. So that's what their uh, two uh, different functions on and why the listener is so important, because without the listener uh, being up and configured properly, no external applications such as SQL Developer can actually communicate with your database.
So, okay, we have uh, we have jammed through that. And uh, what if we wanted to, uh, if we take a look at what we see here, we can see in our listener status that, hey, there's a couple of things communicating on port 5500 and 5501. And those are actually um, the enterprise manager uh, instances associated with our two databases. So if you were running uh, Firefox for the first time and hadn't done anything to it and tried to go to one of these uh, instances, you would find out that you receive an error because you don't have Flash installed. What you do should see when you um, go to your server at port 5500 and hit the EM is to actually see a login page that looks like this. What you're going to see if uh, if, if you haven't uh, installed Flash is, is pretty much a, a message that says, hey, you need Flash, and you need to go out and get it. So if you were to, um, say, check Adobe Flash in your search box, and you should find uh, some support from Adobe here, and you come out here, and there'll be a little utility that'll tell you what uh, version of Flash that you're actually running. So um, if I check now, it's going to say, hey, um, you do have Flash. It's not the latest version since like, you know, yesterday or something. But um, hey, I've got Flash, or Flash and it works. If you don't have it and you need to install it, you can click the download link and come out here and it will say, hey, you're on Linux. But then it's going to give you a bunch of different choices. And uh, originally, I think I might have told you guys to use this yum for Linux, but uh, that actually doesn't appear to work very well. So what you really want to do is select this RPM for other Linux. And when you select this and click down, download now, what should happen is you'll actually get a pop-up from your machine saying, hey, do you want to save this or just open it with the application installer? It is perfectly fine to just go ahead and let the application installer do its thing. It's going to pop up and say, hey, would you like to install Adobe Flash? And uh, I am uh, probably upgrading my Flash as we speak here. And it may ask you for your password, which you can give it. And then um, it will go ahead and install uh, Adobe Flash for you. And then the way that you can tell whether or not uh, this is actually uh, completed uh, correctly is you'll be able to go, after it's done, you'll be able to go to your uh, preferences or I'm sorry, to add-ons in the, in the drop-down box for Adobe. And you should see Shockwave Flash over here. And if you see that, then uh, everything should be hunky-dory and you just need to make sure that it's uh, activated. Now, uh, after you've done that, like I said, you should be able to log in here and then you can actually log in with your sys credentials, the same as if you were logging in to the database. You will need your password as SysDBA. I'm going to go ahead and click log in. And then when I log in, I'm going to see something that looks like this. And uh, we're going to be doing uh, assignment three and four, I think, are, are going to we're going to utilize uh, this interface. So it's important that you make sure that it's working and, uh, and that you can access it. And then I would encourage you to go wander around uh, inside of this once you do have it up and up and working. So that covers making sure that your enterprise manager is working and then technically you should have an instance for it if you have two databases. You'll see in your listener to control that it'll be uh, configured on different ports. Uh, you may get a, a message like this that says, hey, this thing doesn't have a certificate. Um, that's fine. Uh, there's nothing horrible going on. It just doesn't come with the certificates installed. So we will uh, go ahead and accept that. And then we'll see if I log in here. Oops, sorry, thinking of a different application. 
we'll see that this time I'm actually logging into the enterprise manager instance for my CDB2 database instance. And so you can see over here that this is uh, my CDB2 as the other one was related to the my CDB1. And you uh, should have as many instances of EM as you do uh, container databases uh, on your database server. So if anybody has any questions about that, please be sure to ask. All right, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and close Enterprise Manager because we're not gonna do anything more with that for right now. All right, so we've kind of gone over uh, starting and stopping again and uh, how to do that manually, uh, playing with SQL Plus, getting your listener started up, what to do if, uh, if you don't do them in the right order, uh, using that uh, alter system register to make sure that the database is registered with the listener. And then we kind of touched on, again, um, how to... Um, plug into MySQL developer uh, or to SQL developer. Uh, one of the other things I had gotten a question about is uh, somebody had kind of missed on um, how to uh, create a startup trigger on these pluggable databases. Pluggable databases do not start automatically out of the box with your container databases and there's uh, good reasons for that because you might have a hundred of them and only want to start one or two. But you can configure them to uh, start auto magically and, and the way that you do that in SQL Developer, uh, you could do it manually via SQL Plus but I'm not a big fan of typing. Uh, you actually come out here and select this DBA view, and then if you connect uh, to using the same connection that you would use for Sys to your MyCDB1, you'll see that you actually have a um, list of pluggable databases under this container database folder here. And if you wanted to set a startup trigger, you can just right click it and go ahead and uh, click this create startup trigger. Now I've obviously already got one set up for uh, my PDB1 on my CDB1 because we can see that this thing is open in read write mode uh, already. If I wanted to uh, alter the state of this uh, pluggable database, it's easy enough for me to come out here and uh, say do something like close, and then if we watch what happens here, uh, this changes to a status of uh, mounted, which really means it's not gonna be usable by any external applications. And uh, if I wanted to change that, then I could just come out here and modify the state again and uh, open this thing, read, write, hit apply, and then this database will be available, this pluggable database will be available for uh, me to use at this point. So please do go out and play with these various functions. Uh, don't be afraid to murder a database right now. If you do something horrible to it, you can use DBCA to delete it and create another one. And I would encourage you to delete and create a database um, just cause. So you get used to that idea that it's, uh, it's not the end of the world to create uh, you know, some new instances, especially in a uh, development environment like this. Uh, you can also use this to, instead of using the DBCA uh, utility to create pluggable databases, you can actually come out into SQL Developer and say, hey, I would like to create a new uh, pluggable database. So for instance, if I wanted to create my C or my PDB3 on um, my CDB1, these names are arbitrary, so you can name them whatever you want to. Uh, give this thing a password, um, and all you're doing here is really creating an administrative user that only has administrative privileges to this particular pluggable database. Uh, for your file name conversions, 
you would want to uh, create a little rule here. And uh, really what happens when you create one of these new pluggable databases is it creates it off of a template. And so um, what you want to make sure um, happens is if we look here, we can see that this PDB seed is our template database. And uh, if we look at the target file, um, it's creating this whole file system that is uh, really just a complete copy of that. So when we, when we do this, often what we want to do is just replace this PDB seed with uh, whatever the name is going to be for our new uh, database and the easiest way to do that is with uh, one of these expressions where you say PDB seed and you replace that with the name of your pluggable database and now um, I'm going to go ahead and click apply and it will create a brand spanking new pluggable database for me without having to go through the sort of mechanics of, of opening the database configuration assistant. And you can uh, create them, delete them, unplug them, uh, pretty much do anything from an administrative perspective uh, right here in SQL Developer. And I find that to be uh, quite a bit more convenient than uh, some of the other ways uh, to do it. Now we can see again that this thing is just uh, defaults into a mounted state. If I wanted to make this thing available to use, I would modify the state like we talked about before. I can open this thing up read write. I can go ahead and turn the thing back off by modifying the state again and closing it. And then one of the other things you can do, which we will kind of dig into at a later date, is we can uh, drop, and I'll show you how to do that. We can clone, so if you have a database you want to create another one, uh, you can just make a complete copy of it. Or you can actually unplug this thing. And unplugging is really where we get into this concept of being able to transfer this from one database server to another. And uh, all this can be managed from within SQL Developer. And uh, if you get curious and want to try this out, then I would encourage you to go uh, look into it and see if you can do it. Uh, otherwise, we'll be uh, we'll dig it, be digging into that a little bit later. Then you see this last option is you can clone PDB to Oracle Cloud. So Oracle is uh, is is working very hard to make it uh, easy for you to take your stuff in your data center and move it up to their cloud infrastructure and uh, and back. And so uh, you can actually, if, if you happen to have an Oracle Cloud account, just come out here and say, I would like to move my database to the cloud. And uh, off it will go to the cloud, uh, just about as automagically as it looks. Um, they haven't tried quite as hard on the moving it back part yet, so <laughs> you might find that a little more difficult. But uh, they seem to have the moving it up part pretty well, uh, pretty well under control. So um, if I wanted to get rid of this thing, I could come out here and say, hey, let's drop this pluggable database. Um, I don't want to keep any of the data files uh, included with that particular pluggable database, so I'll say including. And if I happen to be curious about the SQL that was being written uh, to actually perform these type of things, I could actually come out and look at the SQL that's being generated by the, by the GUI here. And this is one of the great ways to really dig in and learn how certain things are done. Uh, should you be needing to do some of this stuff manually, which you will undoubtedly have a uh, use case for at some point or another. So I'm going to go ahead and click apply. You will see that it's successfully processed that command and uh, our pluggable database has been disposed of. Other things uh, in this panel that uh, I would encourage you to just mess around with are uh, things like storage you can come in and actually see how um, table spaces and all of the um, objects that we're going to talk about inside the database can actually be created 
and sort of what the status of them is and uh, where they live and kind of how they're configured. And this is a great way to sort of delve into really beginning to understand how this stuff works and getting comfortable with this idea that, oh, wait a second, uh, these are just files on a, on a server. Um, it's really not, uh, there's really not any magic going on. It's just a, a manner of understanding uh, what's happening by exploring uh, these utilities that are available um, that will hopefully help you to make some of the stuff that you read in the textbook a, a lot clearer. So with these dev boxes, I encourage you to play with them because uh, uh, they will undoubtedly uh, make you smarter. All right, so I'm gonna turn all of that uh, stuff off and we're gonna click out of here. And really the next thing that I want to dig into is this concept of uh, setting up your database to auto start. And here is where I really want to dig into the idea of utilizing the documentation. So we are going to use the documentation to complete this task because I want you to know that I have not learned anything about databases that I did not pick up from somewhere else. And uh, a lot of times the documentation will uh, will be your friend in this respect. And uh, I emailed the link to the doc that I'm gonna use here. And then other times, you know, maybe the documentation isn't so much of your friend. And uh, you might wanna go find uh, some blog posts and stuff like that where people have uh, gone through the effort of trying to make it uh, easier for you because <laughs> Oracle's documentation isn't a hundred percent clear all of the time and uh, And that's not necessarily a horrible thing sometimes because uh, people like me get to make their livings off of uh, stuff not being easy so uh, here I am I am at the uh, Oracle Database 12.1 uh, documentation, and I am on this section that talks about automating the database startup and shutdown on other operating systems. And the operating system that we are primarily concerned with is the Linux operating system. So uh, the very first thing it wants us to do is go out and look at this uh, file called uh, Aura Tab. And the Aura Tab file is created automatically when you uh, fire up a database. So I'm gonna pull that off the screen here for a second. And we will jump down on our server and we'll see if we can find this here file that they're referring to. So I'm gonna open up a terminal. The documentation says that uh, I will find this thing at the um, uh, etc in the etc directory, and uh, it'll be named or a tab. So I'm just going to switch over to this etc directory. I think we've touched on this thing before, and do a list. And hey, look at this. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. And uh, the question for us is: Is there a file called or a tab? And what do you know? There it is. So if we open this thing up, what will we find? Well, uh, really the, the big thing that we're gonna find here, and I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger, is uh, I actually have two entries in here for uh, the databases that I've created. And if you create more databases, there should be additional entries added to this file. Or uh, if not, you may have to go out and, and add them if you wanna configure other stuff to auto start. And so uh, right down here, you'll see this rather cryptic N and this other rather cryptic N. And basically what that means is, hey, is this thing gonna be auto started? And uh, if we want it to auto start, then all we have to do is change that N to a Y. And I'm gonna auto start both of my instances. And uh, what this will do is the system will know that, hey, uh, when I shut this thing down or start this thing up, I should use the uh, auto start or auto stop utilities to uh, shut down or start up my database. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and save that. 
and uh, that's the the first step in in the documentation. So after you've done that, it feels like things are going to be easy, but it, it's not quite that easy. Uh, so the next very next thing it tells us to do, if we take a look here, we've gone out and we have uh, we've edited this Aura tab file. We changed that to a Y. And now it wants us to go out and create a file uh, in this uh, initd uh, directory. And really what your initd directory is, is a directory where there's a bunch of stuff the server knows to do when it starts. Um, so what we need to do is actually create a file in here to be executed at that time. Now you can see it's got sort of all this uh, confusing looking uh, stuff here in this script file, but the great part about it is uh, you can pretty much just uh, uh, copy this mostly verbatim uh, from, uh, from the documentation and uh, presuming that you have installed it using sort of the standard uh, architecture, uh, it is highly likely that you won't have to do much of anything. But we can see here that it wants you to change the uh, value of the Oracle home environment variable to match your environment. And uh, it wants you to change the, um, the username of the owner of the database um, to what it is and it's Oracle. And oh, by the way, that's ours too. Uh, so uh, really this script ought to just pretty much work for us right out of the box. So I am going to go to this uh, init D directory. And if we see we're in the ETC directory already. And if we look uh, up the page just a little bit, we should find init D. There it is right there. You can see that it's colored funny because it's a directory. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to that. And uh, at this point, if I was to do the present working directory, we'll see that we are in the init D directory. So I'll just go ahead and clear my screen up here. And I'll list this directory because I'm just kind of uh, curious about what type of stuff's in here and nope. Oh, there's some stuff in here and uh, I'm not gonna mess with any of it. because Now the documentation wants us to create a file and that file is going to be named dbora. So the way I'm gonna create that file is I'm gonna type, type vi dbora. And now I have a blank file with nothing in it. I'm gonna hit I to insert. And I'm going to go back to the documentation. And I am going to copy everything that they have so wonderfully put here for me. Let's make sure we can get it all. Sometimes it's a little easier with the browser to copy up instead of down. So you want to be careful to make sure you get all of this stuff or things will not work the way you want them to. I will jump back to my box here. I'm going to go ahead and paste this in. And then we can see that we have, uh, you'll want to check that you have a, a file that looks just like what they have there in the documentation. Um, and so I do. Um, and then if I wanted to check the value of my Oracle home because I was paranoid, uh, we should have already set up our bash RC. So the only thing we would need to do is open another terminal and type in echo dollar sign Oracle home, which basically means please barf out the value of this variable. And we can see that our Oracle home is U01 app Oracle product 12.1.0 slash DB home one. So we don't have to do anything. We know that the uh, OS uh, owner of this is, um, is, um, is our Oracle user. So we should be pretty well squared away here. And then uh, the other things that we can see that are, are going on here is these um, Host name is actually a, a command here where it's pulling the host name from the, uh, 
local system, same with the username. And so if we have done everything correctly, uh, our auto start uh, ought to just work after we save our file here. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead, hit escape and write this file. And um, what it's basically telling me here is, hey, you opened up in a directory that you don't actually have, uh, you don't actually have the permissions to uh, utilize, right? And so what I should have done is use the sudo command. So I'm gonna go ahead and just quit that. I'm gonna use sudo db or uh, I will again, paste my stuff in here and confidence is high so I'll go ahead and write that file and then you see that time it wasn't mad at us about it so uh, following along with the, what the doc says here we've created this file and um, it's basically telling us here that hey if you've got a non uh, the default listener name, then you're going to have to set some stuff here, but you don't have to worry about it because we didn't do that. And so the only thing we really need to do then is set the permissions for this uh, file that we just created. And so now uh, we will again just take the commands right out of the documentation. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and paste this. And what this is saying is, uh, change the group to DBA for this DBA, DB or a file. And uh, before we execute that, if we were to do an LS-L, we would see the ownership and uh, other attributes related to these files. We can see that uh, DB or is owned by root. Now, if we um, execute this command um, as sudo, because the Oracle user does not have permission to do that. And we reissue our list command. We'll see that the group has been changed to DB uh, Aura, uh, or the group has been changed to DBA on this DB Aura file. And then if we go back to our documentation and take a look here, it also wants us to change the permissions on this file. Uh, essentially who can read, write, and execute it. Jumping back, go ahead and execute this command. And again, it should have been as sudo. I do that a lot in case you can't tell. And now um, if we look at what the permissions on this file were before we executed that command, and then we execute it again, we can see that we have changed the permissions on them. And so that should make it possible for the auto start utility to uh, work uh, before, uh, or work when we start our machine up. So there's only one last thing the uh, documentation requires of us here. And we can see on Linux, it just wants us to uh, execute uh, a bunch of these commands and then you do all these as, uh, as a uh, sudo as well. And so um, this is really just making it so the commands can execute properly. So I'm just gonna copy these out here one at a time from the doc into my browser or into my instance here, sudo, paste, everything is great. I will go out and grab the next command making sure that I'm careful to use the commands that are specific to the OS platform I am working on. Jumping back to VNC, sudo, paste that thing in there, and then grab the last one here. All right, so I've executed all those commands and theoretically at this point, I ought to be able to auto start my uh, database, but how do I prove it? Well, there's a couple different ways we can do it. So 
uh, one uh, the one way I want you to do it in the document or in your assignment and I'm going to go ahead and, and open up the document for this right now is I want you to actually issue these commands um, from the bin directory that will allow you to kind of uh, you'd be issuing the same commands that the system would be issuing. So if we go down through our screenshots here, and this is attached to your assignment, uh, near the end you'll actually see a command for invoking the DB shut and, and DB start commands. And we can see that we're actually down in this, uh, in this bin directory uh, on the um, on our database instance, and so we actually have to uh, navigate to that directory in order to be able to execute this. And uh, I was real nice to you guys and didn't actually tell you where it was. So uh, what we want to do is actually go look around for that thing, right? So where are these DB start commands? Uh, db start and db shut command. So the first thing you can do is come out here and take a look. Well, does the documentation tell me where it is? And if you actually roll up through here, you can see that it tells us use the db start and db shut scripts, which are located in the Oracle home bin directory. And so you might think, well, uh, I know that Oracle home path is really wrong, that long, that's going to be painful to uh, type in. But one of the beautiful things about having those environment variables set is that you can actually reference them in uh, file paths and whatnot. So if I come over here and I say, hey, I don't want to switch to the Oracle home bin directory, it will actually take me there. And if I go ahead and, and list my present working directory, we can see that it's taken me uh, directly there. So I'll clean up my screen and then we'll list this directory and let's see what's in it. And hey, there's a whole pile of stuff. But what we're really interested in is um, these two scripts up here, DB shut and, uh, and DB start, right? So if we have, uh, have done everything correctly, we ought to be able to use these and they ought to execute auto magically when, uh, when we start and stop our server. So if we go uh, back to uh, the Word doc that has the, the screenshots that you need to do for your assignment in it, and we pull that back over here, you can see that uh, all we should have to do is put dot slash, which in, in Linux means uh, sh uh, execute, and, uh, and this thing ought to do uh, what we ask it to. So I'm going to go ahead and, and give it a try. So I'm going to put dot slash db shut and execute that thing, and it will actually uh, tell me here what it's up to and uh, don't be alarmed by the not able to uh, stop the listener thing. There's some stuff in that other script file that kind of takes care of that for us. And you can see it's actually going through uh, what was our Aura tab file and, uh, and shutting down the MyCDB1 and the MyCDB2 database instances. And uh, after this uh, finishes, uh, one easy way for us to, to prove whether or not uh, it worked, and we know we had both of those running, so I can actually go out to SQL Plus and uh, log in as SysDBA. And it tells me, hey, you are connected to an idle instance. All right, well, I believe you, um, and if I wanted to know what instance I just connected to, I could always reference my Oracle SID, and that should be my um, CDB1, and I, what I should have done there is echo that command. Um, so if I echo that, 
we'll see that it was my CDB1. We knew that was running before we executed the script. It's not running now. So if our start command works correctly, we should be able to run that again and see that it's actually running. So now I'm gonna run the uh, db start uh, command from that same uh, place. And now we'll see that it's going through and running the startup for my CDB1. And then it will also run the startup for my CDB2. And at this point, uh, when it finishes that up, um, we should see that this thing is actually uh, alive and kicking again. So I'm gonna go ahead and run SQL plus one more time. We know that our Oracle SID variable is set to my CDB1, sys as sys DBA, hitting, uh, oh, uh, sys as sys DBA. It always helps to spell it correctly. Go ahead, hit enter, because I know I'm on the OS. And looky there, I am not connected to an idle instance anymore. And uh, if I wanted double double proof, I could do select instance name from v dollar sign instance. And I would be able to observe that I am indeed connected to my CDB1 and it is alive and kicking. So that's all well and good, but that's not, you know, that's cool. Now I don't have to go through all this. I can just use DB start, DB shut, and, and, and sort of bounce my database instances at will. But really what I want this thing to do is to auto magically start and stop for me when I run it from my EC2 console. So now uh, we need to prove whether or not we actually got it set up right. So here I am, the database uh, server instance that we just uh, did all of our configuration on. And if I were to reboot this thing uh, normally, I would kill my database instance and have to go uh, restart it uh, myself. But if, uh, if everything is hunky-dory at this point, I should see that when I reboot this, that the database actually starts. And in this case, it actually starts uh, both of our databases, my CDB1 and my CDB2, uh, because we configured them both to start. So if I created, uh, and then for any of our pluggable databases, if we have our uh, have executed those startup triggers inside of SQL Developer, then the pluggable databases will also automatically start uh, when we restart our server. And should we go on and create uh, MyCDB3, MyCDB4, um, you would find that you can go into that uh, or a tab file and set uh, them to auto start uh, as well. And if we didn't want my CB2 to automatically start, we could go in there and change that, uh, that entry from a Y to an N and it will uh, only automatically start those database instances uh, that we have instructed it to. So now, uh, Flying without a net here, we have to actually prove uh, that uh, that we did this, right? So I'm going to go ahead and uh, and close VNC, uh, open it up again, and uh, because I'm restarting my instance, uh, I get to keep my IP. If I stopped it and then started it, uh, I would probably end up with a different different IP. And now. Uh, when I connect to this thing, I should see that my database instances have started. Now, one thing that you'll find sometimes is this won't be, um, you know, super immediate. So <laughs> you may have to be a little bit patient sometimes. Um, you shouldn't expect to click the button to start your EC2 instance and then be able to instantaneously uh, 
start up, uh, you know, and connect to your database. But within a couple of minutes, this thing ought to work. So a uh, big question for me, if I come in here and open a terminal, uh, one, hey, uh, I've restarted my thing. Did the, did all that configuration with the RC thing work? Well, the easiest way to check it is say echo uh, Oracle home. And if I have not jacked anything up, I should get uh, a variable populated. And that did indeed happen. And so the other thing that we would be hopeful that happened is that our listener actually started. And we can see, hey, I restarted my box. And look at here, this listener apparently started all by its lonesome and fired up all of these services. And at this point, we can pretty much tell, hey, my CDB1 and CDB2 and all those services are, are up and running. So uh, I am 100% confident at this point that, uh, that my database has indeed started. And so at this point, I no longer really ever have to worry about it. I can turn my uh, EC2 instance on and off and my database will follow suit with it uh, with uh, hopefully no harm and no foul. So the, uh, the other thing uh, that I wanted to show you guys was with your EM instance, especially running uh, just about any browser-based thing through VNC on a browser that is local to the actual uh, remote desktop can sometimes be painful and it doesn't render super great all the time. And it's just not always as convenient to run off of that. So if we have, go ahead and open the port for uh, our EM instance, we should actually be able to access it. So I have actually configured my, um, let's see if I can get this thing to escape out of full. I've configured my, um, 5500 instance to um, actually already do that. And here I'm going to stop share so I can get control back on my VNC. And then I'm going to share it back with you guys again. All right. So uh, I've already configured my um, firewall in my EC2 instance to actually let me get to. Um, to my 5500 to my EM instance running on the 50 on port 5500. So if we go ahead and look over at my security group, we take a look at my inbound rules. I came out here and set uh, 5500 as open with the EC2 um, console. And then the other thing I had to do is I actually had to run the uh, firewall commands, which you guys may remember from before. Now, uh, there is actually, I think, an easier way to do this, and we can even try this out sort of uh, uh, live here and prove if I'm an idiot or not. But if you come out to applications, you can actually configure your firewall uh, right from, uh, I think I want to say it's the utilities here. So let me see if I can find that thing. It might be under the settings. Let's take a look here. I know that there is a firewall control. I just have to remember where it is. If not, we'll just do it manually, but it's trying to make your life seem easier. There it is under the sundry menu. So if we open up firewall in here, um, we should actually be able to see that, uh, that I manually opened a, a port up here. And so right there you can see, hey, wait, 5500 is, is open. And uh, I did that manually uh, via the command line, the same way we did it before when we were opening up our, uh, our ports for our VNC viewer. Now, if I wanted to, first of all, let's just prove, hey, can you actually get to your EM instance on uh, 5500? So uh, the way that I would do that is I would look at my instance 
and I would see the public DNS for this thing, and hey, I'll even use the, the long one, I won't use the EP, uh, IP address. I can uh, put this thing in here, colon 5500 for the port and slash EM, and if I have everything configured correctly, um, I should be able to access this thing. And so um, what I'm seeing right here is, hey, uh, you can't actually hit that thing. And there's a couple of different reasons that could be. Um, first, let's just try the public IP instead. Oh, the reason is I pasted this thing in here and you can see up here when we look at the address bar, it says HTTP. Well, this thing is actually running uh, as HTTPS. So you need to prefix it with that. So instead of just pasting the command in or pasting the address in there, I'm gonna put HTTPS and then I'm gonna run it here. And again, my browser is gonna be mad at me. It's gonna say, hey, uh, this application you're trying to reach doesn't have any certificates and uh, I'm worried that you're going to some nefarious site. We happen to know that we're not. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and say, it's okay, thank you for trying to save me, but I'm confident that this is all right. And so now uh, what will happen is using the browser on my local desktop and, you know, my, my regular machine, I can actually come out here and log into uh, EM using uh, my local browser, which a lot of times is super handy because uh, one, you just have a better experience with the local browser and then you gain access to you know all of the local stuff that's on your your local machine and so now hey here i am inside of enterprise manager i can see i'm logged into my cdb1 and okay won't this make life easy when uh, when i want to access this thing later now, uh, incidentally, if you have SQL Developer on your local machine, we know that port 1521 is already open. And so you ought to be able to access your database via SQL Developer from your local machine. And uh, I will leave that to you guys to prove should you want to use SQL Developer locally. I prefer it. Uh, I have SQL Developer running locally on my machine and it's just easier that way a lot of times. So uh, a lot of times what I will do is I'll have a browser, SQL Developer, I need to interact with that database and I'll just come out to my EC2 management console, fire that thing up, and then just use all the tool sets that I'm used to using on my local machine rather than having to jump out there and, uh, and jack around with uh, what's out up there on the desktop. I always like to have a desktop because there's always going to be some stuff I want to do out there. Um, but uh, just know that there's all sorts of different uh, ways you can go about this. Now, uh, the other thing that we'll find out here is if I try to hit uh, 5501 right here, which is where we know our my CDB2 instance of Enterprise Manager is running, I should find out that uh, that it can't find it because this port is not open on uh, either my management console or uh, out there on my um, out there on my actual server and i have to do uh, both of those things there's sort of two layers of uh, of network security to contend with so we can see here it says hey i can't find this thing that you're looking for so first thing we need to do jump back out to our security rules that we are familiar with uh, I need to add another rule for port 5501. I'll just type 5501 in here. I will say save. Um, it's mad at me because I didn't define a IP. Uh, I'm going to open it to the whole world because, you know, I'm just not that scared. And then we can see we have port 5501 open. Now if we go out to VNC, jump onto our local desktop, we should be using this firewall utility, be able to open 5001 here without typing all those obscure commands. It will of course want to have a password because that's just the way it is. And then at that point, I have added port 5501 to the firewall here. 
and with any luck, if nothing, uh, if everything is uh, going uh, the way we want it to here, should just be able to close this thing and go access this from my local browser. So let me try this thing one more time. So hey, we're getting this, your connection is not private thing because uh, it's mad about the same thing it was mad about before. And then at this point we can see it's, uh, it's actually going about making the connection to our other instance. And so you can see that we are indeed connected to a different enterprise manager instance. And we can prove that beyond the shadow of a doubt by logging into it and seeing which database it is that we are referring to. And so once we log in here, we will find out that we are actually logged into the enterprise manager for my CDB2, which we can see up here. And then we have access to all of those things. So uh, after making you guys suffer through learning how to do all this stuff on the command line, you can see that there's actually lots of little handle, handy graphical utilities that let you do it uh, sans the command line. And it's really kind of a preference thing. Some people prefer the command line stuff and you know, good for them. I have my moments. Uh, but a lot of folks just like the convenience of using the, the GUI interfaces, and, and I happen to be one of those folks. Now, if you look at Enterprise Manager, what you will figure out is, hey, there's a whole lot about my database that, uh, that Enterprise Manager knows about, and I can come out here and paw around and figure out what it is. Um, and there is just a slew of uh, variables that... Uh, uh, your or parameters that your database uh, has set or can be set and uh, you can come out here and view these and this will be some of the stuff that uh, that we mess around with here shortly you can also come out and have a look at the uh, memory usage and and set up for your uh, database and it will show you things like um, how your memory is allocated across the, the various pools. And the textbook uh, begins to talk about this stuff quite a bit. We're letting our database auto manage all this stuff and, and that's a good thing. Uh, but uh, just be aware that you can come out here and have a look at this type of thing. And then there are other, uh, all sorts of stuff out here. You can see what features are being utilized by your database. And uh, this is particularly uh, important uh, in uh, scenarios where, let's see, do we click used? Let's see, in scenarios where you have to be concerned about license management, um, clearly I'm uh, not, selecting something correctly here, but you guys can play around with this. And then there's uh, other information that you can find out here about database properties, the amount of storage that you're using, what your time zones are set to. You can, hey, here's the character set that the database is using. Just all sorts of stuff you might need to know as an administrator about your database. You'll also find, um, lots of stuff about storage, and a little bit of sort of overlap of stuff that you can do with SQL Developer as well. Um, so it, it's kind of up to you to decide uh, what you like. We're definitely going to be doing some exercises here. There's some things you can see in here that SQL Developer is not going to be so easy about and vice versa. You can also manage users and roles using Enterprise Manager. So if you wanted to just come out here and add a user or add a role or check things like what table spaces and whatnot are used by what users, you can use this interface to do so. And then there's also um, a bunch of information about the performance of your database. Uh, it kind of keeps a running uh, uh, tally of various uh, statistics around the stuff that is happening on your database. And this really comes around to uh, this idea of performance and, and something that a lot of DBAs have to concern themselves with is figuring out 
uh, why is this database not quite performing the way we're expecting it to or why am I getting uh, you know complaints about this that or the other thing and you can use uh, this interface to really dig into that type of stuff you can monitor particular SQL statements you can look at all sorts of uh, activities going on on your database and then uh, ultimately there is a, a whole utility built, built into the Oracle database about helping you to uh, track and, and tune your database and that's uh, uh, around the, the AWR um, functionality so uh, go out poke around with this thing take a look see what's going on maybe try you know uh, changing or adding a user or something like that um, just wander around that's a, that's the purpose of this class that's the purpose of you guys uh, setting all this stuff up and, and making it functional. So uh, you're meant to use it. Uh, this is uh, really what we're digging into. And now as we uh, hopefully you guys have uh, read the database a little bit, now you have a, a database completely set up and ready to go. And uh, really all of the things that are being explained in the textbook at this point, you should have the tools available to you to come out and look and explore and really understand uh, exactly what it is the, the author is talking about. Um, so that gets us really, uh, I believe, to the point I wanted to get to for this week. Um, and I will post up the, uh, the PowerPoint slides here in a few minutes, but uh, that'll be uh, pretty much, uh, they'll be relatively short because we referenced uh, the documentation there as a, as a big part of some of the commands we, we executed tonight. So I will, at this point, give you guys the opportunity, if you would like, to ask any questions, or if anybody would like some help with anything, uh, now is the time to ask. Uh, otherwise, um, if there aren't any questions or uh, there's nobody who wants any help, you guys are uh, free to... Uh, you know, take this half hour or better of your time back and, and hopefully go work on your assignment. And uh, please, if you haven't started assignment two, get started on it. And next week, I will be providing you guys the instructions for how we uninstall uh, the current version of Apex delivered with our database, install the latest version, which we will download from uh, Oracle, and we're going to do something called installing the uh, uh, Oracle uh, REST data services uh, for the database, which really uh, stands up a kind of independent server to create a um, GUI uh, interface for developing on top of the Oracle database. One of the least utilized and most powerful platforms, uh, development platforms that every organization has is their database. And so if you're interested in being a DBA, I'm hoping to convince you to uh, make available to developers and other folks uh, that functionality with which really makes the database uh, super powerful. Uh, a lot of folks kind of think a database's uh, sole function is, is to store data that is, uh, that is otherwise uh, manipulated and um, you know, dealt with by other applications. And the fact of the matter is the Oracle database and lots of other database platforms are extremely powerful development platforms and there's very much you can do uh, towards developing applications without ever getting outside of them. And uh, so I want you guys to understand how to uh, facilitate that and hopefully develop an attitude that uh, if you do become a DBA, you want to facilitate that. Because uh, I know in my career, there's nothing I have hated more than DBAs who wouldn't let me touch stuff. And uh, so don't be like that because uh, these databases cost an extraordinary amount of money and have a ton of power. Uh, the server that we have configured here is uh, would probably cost in the uh, 
well over a hundred thousand dollars to license and in many tens of thousands of dollars a year in licensing maintenance to uh to purchase if uh, if this was not just a dev environment for us. So understanding that it costs that much money and that uh, organizations are willing to pay for it should make you wonder, what is it that uh, makes this thing worth that much money? And uh, and that's what you really need to dig into as, uh, as sort of a, a student of database technology. What type of things can I actually do with this? And, uh, so hopefully uh, we'll be setting you upon that journey. Anyways, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my camera and I'm gonna give you guys a, a minute or two to uh, ask any questions if anybody has any and feel free to uh, type them into the chat window or if you uh, just wanna unmute and, and ask directly, that's, uh, that's fine as well. And then if, uh, if I don't hear from anyone here in the next couple minutes, I will go ahead and, uh, and shut down the meeting. And, uh, and I will look to hear from you guys if you have uh, any questions later on uh, via Skype or email. All right, have a good night.